Kaya, a good enough heat exchanger that's better than most of the stock heat exchanger. And here it is. Uh, most of this crap here is just to monitor the temperatures and the situation that's going on, just so we can see what's happening inside our heat exchanger. The thing about this heat exchanger is it can be any size, any number of blocks. It can have as much pressure as you want, because if you uh, block this in and then have the internal temperature at, let's say, 60 uh, megapascals, you can have the pipes inside it at 120 megapascals, just as long as the pressure differential doesn't exceed 60 megapascals. So this is infinitely expandable, whereas the other ones isn't. At this point, the counterfloor heat exchanger was just released like a couple hours ago. I haven't looked at it at all. All that I've looked at is what resources you need to make it. And it's like steel and invar. That's what prompted me to make this video because why do we need invar? They're trying to overcomplicate the heat exchangers. This is a simple heat exchanger. So what's the test stand? Well, we have two cooling sources over here set up. We've got an active vent, a powered vent, sorry. Powered vent sucking in air and blowing it down. That'll be the, our first test. Second one is passive. That's just a bunch of vents over here. And that goes down this line. Indoor heat exchanger, which we'll look at in a minute. This wall is just to stop wind blowing. And out these pipe nubs. I generated a dick ton of hot gas. 1,800 and one C of gas in here that's hot and heavy. I generated it with an H2 combustor that is just sitting here doing dick all. The heat exchanger is just a bunch of radiators inside a cell. So I went a row of convection, a row of radiative, row of convection, and the outside two lines here. So I've got three on this side, three of this side, three on each one, so nine, 18. And that goes down to our hot gas. And in the middle, exact same thing, but a line of one. So uh, convective, radiative, convective. Uh, the reason that I mix them up is because one does one thing better than the other, but they both do the same. They both do it at the same time. So you will radiate heat and you will convect heat. They are two different equations and that's just happening. Just make sure that it all happens. You don't need as many radiative. I could have probably gotten away with just one radiative, so it would be three radiative, two radiative, or sorry, three convective, two convective, three convective, but this way is just as good. Now we're going to do this the powered way, so we're going to use a pump. You don't need to use the pump, we're just going to use the pump for fun. Everything's all set up. Turn the pump up to 10 liters, and we'll turn that on. And that pump will move hot gas from this side to this side. This is the temperature inside the chamber and it's coming up as we're flooding this pipe here with hot gas. Sorry, no, this is the chamber. Yes, this is the chamber, so that's that sensor there. Uh, this is the center pipe's temperature uh, inside these two valves. These two valves are just isolating so we can see what the temperature is on both sides, just for fun. Uh, this is the temperature over here. This is the temperature over here. Wait a minute, did I do two? I think I might have done two. Oh, sorry. No, this is the temperature on this on this pipe. So this is this pipe. This one is this one. So that's the inside temperature. This one is this one. And this one is this one. And then this one is the big tank. And you can see the tank isn't changing because it hasn't been touched yet. We're still pumping up the pressure on this side. We're at 1.7 megapascals. It has to overcome 2.32 megapascals, which won't be a problem. Pumps are very efficient at equalizing pressure. So if both sides of your pump are equal, then the pump really isn't using any energy whatsoever. You can do that with a valve, but we're not using a valve, we're using a pump because we want to see these numbers change because people love numbers. I love numbers. So our inlet temperature over here, coming from that active or powered vent, sorry, is about five degrees. It's going through this 15 degree exchange here because the center pipe is 15 degrees. And then it goes and spits it out over there. And this pipe is seven degrees. Now the reason that this pipe is lower is because you have some back filling going on, whatever. And this is the temperature of this pipe, which is going down slowly. So it is working. 
and the temperature inside the chamber is just because you need some kind of transfer medium. This could be a vacuum and uh, you could have radiative radiators all communicating with one another, but because of the way the game works, as soon as you have an atmosphere, it nerfs the radiative radiators so they don't work properly which is not how that works in real life. If you had a room full of, of radiators that were constructed and painted in a specific way that would release the wavelength in infrared, and there's a really great video on YouTube, look for something like infrared paint or cooling paint or something like that. There's several uh, videos. One is from, hopefully I just flashed the name in front of it because it's a really great it's a really great YouTube channel. Actually, there's two YouTube channels that might have, that might, one of them might discuss in the future. But basically, if you had a room full of those, and then you had glass that was not infrared reflective, pointing straight up at the sky, it would radiate out, uh, heat out into space. That's difficult for some people to understand because they don't visualize heat being a wave like sunlight. But it is. So if you can channel this cone of heat in such a way that it doesn't hit anything on the planet and just goes out into space, then it never comes back to you. Some of it comes back to you because it does hit molecules in the air, but air molecules are very not dense, so that works out that way. And I think we're almost overcoming our pressure. We have overcome our pressure. So now we're cooling down our main line, and we can see we're cooling down semi-quickly about one degree every second or two. Yeah, about, about a second and a half, two seconds. And again, that's just with one cell. The only advanced technology we're using is steel, and steel is about the first thing you go for. You just need iron, coal, and a bunch of heat. And uh, this heat would be more than sufficient to make the actual radiators, make the steel for the radiators. All of this can be much, much more efficient. We put it in a block, we fill the block up with a lot of atmosphere, and that will give us uh, more than enough medium to transfer heat around with the with the convection radiators. Some people think that these radiators are interfering with each other because they're all in a tight space. They're not. The game indexes all the objects in the world and then goes from object to object running the calculation API on them one at a time. So unless you are extremely close in temperature, they won't interfere with each other at all. If they're within a 10,000th, so everything in the game is to the power of 10. So as soon as you get like really close down that way uh, to like negative um, 10, negative e to, to the power of 10, or e to the power of negative 10, then you will see start seeing strange stuff happening because the calculation will have rounding errors. But this far apart, no rounding errors. Okay, let's see how much we lose our efficiency here. If we go over here, and these powered vents are kind of expensive to run power-wise. Plus, you have to run a, a cable to them, so we will kill it. There we go. But because this is now passive, we will have to remove these here so that it goes straight through. And we didn't even lose that much efficiency. We're still going down about one, uh, one degree every second and three quarters or something like that. Okay, so now we have to have a little bit of a safety issue here. Let's change this to pressure. There we go. And because I'm, if I take off this pump and that valve there, and I change them with pipes, this space is going to increase its temperature rapidly. And it could blow out the, the walls, and we don't really want that to happen. But let's just let it happen, just to show that you can have a completely passive system. There we go. Now the temperature is going to rapidly increase, rapidly decrease. That's just the, uh, the, uh, that. There we go. Unfortunately, we now know have a we no longer have a pressure reading in there. But since everything is communicating with everything else, and we're not like shoving it through with a with a pump, I really thought that that would uh, that would break the walls, but it doesn't seem to be doing it. Oh no, it is breaking the walls. But our temperature is going down even more rapidly now. None of the walls are broken yet. You can see here. So all of this is just passive cooling from the atmosphere across this line and the hot gas in this line. It's completely uncontrolled and we are just about to lose the walls. And let's make some iron sheets. Let's grab our torch here. 
And we'll sort of fix them on the fly here so they don't blow up. It's still rapidly falling. Let's see if I can't sneak a sensor in there without it melting. Uh, oh, let's see if that's far enough. I don't think that's far enough. That might actually read the outside air. Yeah, it's reading the outside air, so that's not very useful for us. But temperature is already at 1,000 degrees. The old heat exchanger, I think, probably uses as much steel as it's in here. Okay, I think we just did lose our side here, so let's fix that. And of course, because we blew it out, we've equalized the pressure now. So I've been recording for about 17 minutes. I probably skipped through a lot of that 17 minutes. We're watching this thing cooling. We've probably been cooling for 15 minutes and we've lost over half of the energy that we had in this tank. And we're still cooling just with this homemade exchanger. So the normal heat exchanger, you would need 10 steel and 10 invar. So the amount of material that you're putting in this is still a whole lot less. Remember we have, we just have steel panels here and we're gonna fix this steel panel here because it's about to blow. Let's really work on getting a reading here. We'll, we'll get an indirect reading. We'll shove our head in here. And we'll just put a pipe out here that's connected to nothing. And we'll grab an analyzer. Connect that up. I'll destroy this. And now we'll look for a pipe analyzer here. Oh, that's the right one because it says not a number. There we go. And we'll go back to pressure. Just so we can maintain, or we can uh, we can review what our pressure is at. And our pressure is still pretty high, but it's falling. And this is a good way to, to get uh, temperature readings when you don't want your cables to uh, burst into flames. It's just put a, a vent pipe segment outside of wherever you're taking your thermal reading and then stick a sensor on there and that will be an indirect reading. 20 minute mark and we are well on our way to getting towards ambient temperature. Again, we could speed this up just by making this thing bigger. So I wanted to see how much steel we would be you would use in a in this standard thing. So two steel and three gold. So we have 27 radiators in there. So we would need 40, 54, we'd need 54 steel, and then who cares about the gold? Gold is just, is fine. So we're still using 10 times the amount of steel in this thing, but we don't have to make invar. And invar is kind of annoying. We need iron and nickel. Actually, it's not that annoying. Still needed to be pretty hot and uh, a lot of pressure. But you'd still, you'd have to wait till this, and I do believe you need uh, your, you need an upgraded... Yeah, you need the tier two, so you need a bunch of shit for that. But with this, it's all tier one material. As you can see, it's it's ridiculously fast. We, we're not controlling anything. There's no pumps. This is using absolutely no power. It's all passive. And it, the reason that I was using pumps to begin with was to make sure that uh, our thing didn't blow up and we could control what we were doing. But it doesn't need to be controlled. If I was a little more intelligent, I would have put a PRV on this thing. So basically just a, a one-way valve going out and then on a vent on this side, a vent on this side. So when this pressure is higher than the outside pressure, it would exhaust that, that excess gas, but I'm not that intelligent. So we're starting to approach equilibrium. We're starting to approach the ambient temp the temperature in the tank being the same as the ambient temperature. So we're going to have less and less efficient heat exchange. So let's artificially increase the heat exchange here. We'll go back to the powered vent. We'll give it its RTG back. We'll cut the passive pipes or the passive vents so that uh, all of the flow goes through this pipe. We'll put a valve on the exit side here. Uh, that way the pressure is higher in the lead up than it is in the exhaust. So there's more mass to absorb energy out of. And that sped it up a little bit. We can speed it up even more by just adding more vents on that side, but we don't really need to at this point. And this design is only if we want to use two isolated networks. 
So a gas that we don't want mixing and a liquid that we don't want mixing, we could use these two things. But what if we want to, say, just use atmosphere? Well, that's easy too. We can use a cooling tower. So we will open up our thingamablobber. There we go. So we got the vents all connected. Let's put that wall back on there before I finish the last vent. We'll connect the pipe up, close that, and then we will cut this here. So now the air from over there is coming in to this cooling tower and it's spitting all of the excess air up there. There we go. Now we have a cooling tower, which is just another form of heat exchanger. And we're cooling our gas down just as quickly. Past the 30 minute mark, we're actually at 3128. And we are basically at ambient now. We're, we're under 100 degrees Celsius, uh, under the boiling point of water, and it's, you know, comfortable temperature out here. It's 19 degrees, and we will reach that very quickly. It's a couple of days later. I've already finished editing the first part of the video, and I decided to put in an example of using the actual counterflow heat exchanger. There is a pro, it's a lot smaller. It's not as big as that one big square, but there's some disadvantages, and we'll see that in a minute. The setup for this is we have pumps on either side of the heat exchanger and uh, for each one of the lines. The faster you can get stuff flowing through this, the faster you can exchange heat. So that's a disadvantage. This uses a whole pile more pressure and it's not infinitely expandable, although you can stack them on top of each other, whatever you want. So let's get this started. And this is just a heater. Fuel gets uh, measured into this pipe and it's already been ignited. It's at 1600 degrees, 1600 degrees. And that will push through this exchanger and it will warm up this gas. I've already warmed it up a little just to, you know, practice. So let's get started. We will turn on the outflow first because we don't want to blow up the pipes. And then we will turn on the inflow at, uh, see how much more power it uses. Okay, I've turned up the heater a bit and we are about to blow up somewhere. So pressure in this inlet is raising too quickly. Uh, because it is expanding, we're having a little bit of problem. But let's just sort this out. There, now we've tuned it. We are now transferring a 125 kilojoules of energy, and we are maintaining about a thousand degrees on the heater pipe. And the tank is raising its temperature quite nicely. Let's just look at it for a few seconds. So obviously the turbo pumps are overkill, and they're hard to balance. If these were just normal pumps. All of these values wouldn't be twitching so much, but this is about the maximum you can get one of these counterflow heat exchangers to go. And here's a much simpler configuration with only two pumps, one on the outlet for this side and one on the outlet for the other side. And then however fast the gas can get sucked into this thing is however fast it moves. It is much less efficient, as you can see, it's at about 34 kilojoules, whereas before we're at 100 and something kilojoules. So having pumps on both sides really brings this thing up, but again, you're wasting a whole lot more power on it. And you still have a restricted flow. You still have to flow through this thing. This setup to me is boring. That's why I showed the previous setups in their different uh, configurations, because it's more interesting to look at. You can put it in your base. You built it yourself. It's just interesting. I have no other words for it. This is just a device sitting there. Now, if this thing had pumps built into it and was more like the advanced furnace kind of deal, I think it would have more potential and more use cases because in that instance, you can plop it down anywhere, give it one cord up to it and have uh, basic pumps that would automatically flow through the thing and it wouldn't require as much setup. As it is now, we're using just as much force floor space as before, but it's just annoying and not as pretty. Anyways, that's it. Whatever is your preference. See you later. Who said I wasn't a troll? Just because I seem intelligent doesn't mean I'm not also a moron.